Hi all, welcome back. Um, today I would like to talk about the so-called 12th century Renaissance, or Renaissance, if you want to tell it French way. Um, this is essentially this um, <coughs> uh, movement, we can say better than, than anything else, that uh, has been called as a, a sort of Renaissance, obviously, compared to the most famous one of the <coughs> of the late Middle Ages and and uh, an early modern era um, because, um, you know, it was a moment in uh, European history, especially in, in Western uh, European history, in which uh, there was an, uh, um, a great um, growth of, um, in parallel with, you know, the general <coughs> The, the general, uh, generally speaking, the, the rest of society from a from an economical, demographical um, point of view, and political and social development, etc., um, um, a sort of intellectual growth, mm -hmm. which <coughs> usually is defined, in fact, by the term Renaissance, and with this ex uh, exception, um, which uh, today we will. Uh, examine and especially we will try to uh, understand in its causes and and why uh, it happened because as you can understand it was a very broad phenomenon that encompassed the whole um, <coughs> western uh, western Europe and 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 it's very interesting because it's one of those phenomena that really um, made uh, Europe in part or at least contributed to make it in a very transversal way and that this shows how in spite of the uh, regional um, and, and, lo and more local differences, we can talk about a common European um, history at that time, culture in, uh, at that time. So, as I was saying before, you know, this uh, Renaissance was really triggered by the broader uh, 11th century rebirth that, uh, you know, um, uh, happened really um, in, in most diverse fields of European society, we usually recall it um, mainly for um, an e um, the economical and demographical growth, but uh, uh, it was something much bigger. It wasn't just something quantitative, which would be impressive just um, on its own, but it was something actually much broader and much more built um, that um, affected essentially the um, the structures of production, uh, the uh, the framing of the uh, the frame of the uh, the new settlements that were growing and expan expanding even uh, territorially the uh, the European European world, and obviously also very important political and institutional processes that we will be seeing now, um, and uh, <laughs> you know that unavoidably changed the the fabric of the whole European society. Um, but at the same time, there is a more um, let's say um, sort of structural ideological level we have to look at that is. Uh, in fact, a development in the field of knowledge itself that we can um, identify as a reflection um, of of this uh, development, uh, which we don't really have to 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 see as as a consequence. You know, it's something that came later. You know, it was probably something that, as a knowledge, uh, actually put in motion itself this process in part and contributed in um, in the <coughs> in the aforementioned processes. Um, and um, it was um, such um, a, um, you know, a deep uh, renewal of, of European, uh, um, of the, the European society that um, is the historians um, talk about it as, in fact, a rebirth of renaissance of the 12th century. Um, so a sort of a uh, well a lesser known Renaissance, mm -hmm. not so meaningful like the one that um, Italy would have seen in the 15th century, and from which it spread all over Europe. But um, you know something uh, that we can see as equally important. Usually we 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 associate the later Renaissance to the concepts of humanism. Well, if you uh, as as if they were something new. Um, we, we conceive humanism as something mainly modern. Mm. But if you really look at medieval 
uh, the medieval culture uh, you see in fact there was a lot of humanism already before a lot of attention for for classical uh, sources a lot of um, a renewed a attention towards the individual and this mainly took all part in the 12th century um, <laughs> so um, let's say that there were new methods and new contents formed in this 12th century that they um, and they come to, to spread in all the various fields of knowledge. And uh, think about the scholastic teaching, uh, the production, uh, and a particular production of written texts, um, which all contributed to change the face of um, the European culture at that time. And we assist to a very uh, important uh, process, which was um, a progressive autonomization of uh, <coughs> delay um, from the church in terms of the mm, monopoly of knowledge and um, the 12th century was really the moment in which you can see in politics as well in society and economics that the lay world starts to be increasingly more uh, aware of itself um, even through ideological means while it had usually been in the high middle ages the church who kind of uh, played uh, the role of the depository of knowledge <coughs> while you know the rest of the world was essentially you know knights fighting uh, so warriors and peasants working the land obviously it, it wasn't um, that fashion not even before but uh, it, it's still <coughs> It's still very meaningful in perspective to look at the 12th century um, compared to, 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 to the previous centuries and see um, how, in spite you know, of the seed that you can find in previous centuries that triggered eventually the um, 12th century renaissance, obviously what happened in this century was very big <coughs> compared to what happened uh, previously. And we can say that um, this uh, 12th century renaissance basically uh, triggered um, an expansion of European um, knowledge and culture that that really wasn't ended up to our day uh, in, in the whole world in the sense that um, you know m there is no coming back essentially from from this moment of of, um <coughs> of growth and there were nothing there was nothing but progress eventually in the western world so um and, <coughs> and regarding the church that we have named as a sort of uh, of loser of uh, in this process mm, which doesn't have to be understood in this way in the sense that mm, the church lost part um, of its monopoly over culture but this is at the same time the moment in which church is um, expanding uh, in power and, uh <coughs> and and influence even cultural one uh, at a scale that was unknown in previous time um, you see that even within the same church there was um, the <coughs> a great opening both uh, from a theo I can't say from a strictly theological way because the church was very careful at that time um, <coughs> and, and would always remain, but uh, um, the same church felt a desire for innovation and, and it sought um <coughs> even new chances of confrontation with others that uh, were in fact manifested in those uh, increasingly more frequent and <coughs> vital uh, debates um, <coughs> over those uh, new and courageous reflections about um, theology and philosophy mostly uh, which wouldn't create such a very few problem consider that um, the 12th century is also the great century of the heresies in, in Western Europe uh, which eventually the, the, uh, the Roman Church would, ab uh, would be able to solve in, in the following century but for telling you how, uh, how much um, how many uh, how much knowledge uh, was put in, into motion in this process and how it didn't belong exclusively to the elites but it's starting to be even a mass phenomenon mm. uh, and it's not surprised that uh, you know these heresies and new uh, heterodox thinking would take place mostly in the centers that were expanding the most that were the, the urban centers mm. Um, so, uh, but why, you know, 
this is something every historian should, should question is why such thing happened. Well, we can't say that at the base of these mm, you know, new and many new experiences um, in the 12th century, especially from an intellectual point of view, uh, we can um, see the um, and and making you know its uh, its very important uh, um, uh, play the intensification of the contacts and of the exchanges and of ideas between men of different origin and culture. Um, <coughs> which uh, were, uh, you know, um, exchanges favored definitely by the development of communications and also of the trade uh, routes, um, which uh, put the West in, in contact with, a, with an increasingly um, higher number of peoples. These are the s centuries of the Crusades, and we never have to, to forget that you know, uh, when you know the, the Westerners went in the Near East, um, trying to uh, reconquer the, the the Holy Lands and establishing all these kingdoms and um, and principalities there, they um, uh, they actually um, you know opened themselves in a certain measure to this new world. Um, this wasn't something that we can say had ever stopped because the West was always in contact with the East, even in the moments of greater um, difficulties for communications uh, in the early Middle Ages. Um, but the intensification of trade brought with itself a lot of, of new, uh, a greater uh, flux of ideas and uh, of knowledges. Uh, the Italians pioneered this process because they were the ones who physically, you know, <laughs> went back and forth with their ships um, uh, along the Mediterranean. Uh, but there was, uh, there was also another channel, there was the Spanish one, because um, a lot of books that would eventually become part of, uh, you know, what was read in the most prestigious universities, like the one of Paris, for instance, came from Muslim Spain. These were texts that um, about Aristotle, about other classical authorities that uh, the Christians, although um, you know these authorities were originally pagan, still regarded as very important. And uh, you know, and this happened before. Notice the time you know that Aristotle would be incorporated uh, into the <coughs> uh, Christian uh, theology by Thomas Aquinas. Um, and 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 this caused not a very few problems because um, there were many new ideas that in fact were escaping to the control of the church mostly, but also of those elites who you know had to lose through the spread of certain knowledge. Um, and this was a source of attrition, but also a great um, source and, and cause of expansion and of intellectual. Um, refinement. So this is uh, extremely fascinating, um, and um, and and this, especially the meeting with with the other peoples um, between the, w the Westerners and the other peoples, um, um, took place uh, mostly, even not only though, uh, uh, within the cities. Here, the cities come back, um, uh, like before, and. Um, the um, economical and political uh, dynamism that uh, was taking place in two cities obviously sort of um, was even fueled by certain certain uh, thoughts and new thoughts and ideas. Think about the recovery of the R of Roman law. It was in the Italian cities that this process happened because in, in Italy at that time uh, the city-states were uh, rising and, and they were essentially searching for um, a new juridical justification and, and even genuine very new juridical um, settlements um, uh, of society like it was for which Roman right had to be reintegrated into the um, the one that existed at that time, or better, the summer rights that existed at that time. Even, even the Holy Roman Empire used those jurists to say, to reclaim, uh, even ideologically, its uh, Roman authority uh, over the subjects, the church, etc. So, you understand, um, this is uh, what I mainly uh, care about, how intermingled 
you know, the all these phenomena were, and, 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 and how, you know, the more they were intermingled, the more they produced um, uh, knowledge and civilization in ultimate analysis. Um, and uh, we see especially, um, and we don't have to forget this, a great technological um, uh, development that, uh, you know, in, in terms of the history of science, we can't really say is something revolutionary, but let's say that all those manuscripts about uh, Roman engineering, about Greek art and stuff, start coming back into Europe. And this doesn't mean that Europe was create was um, you know needing them. If anything, it shows that the people who lived in Europe at that time needed them, as um, you know, because they already had a lot of knowledge on their own, and they wanted to conf and, and and they were able to be willing to look at that and to confront it in order to grow, which is a very important, um, uh, you know, indicator of intellectual uh, development. And I'm talking about technology because um, the economical growth obviously um, saw the rise of merchants and artisans, and. Uh, um, and, and those were people whose crafts uh, crafts were uh, extremely technical, extremely um, and, a, and increasingly more refined. So there was also very a, a great need not just of intellectual you know um, speculations lost in, in the hyperuranium, but really having facts and, and, and you know and numbers and and something you can you could really um, work on to build. Um, essentially European society ad, as we know that from from the Middle Ages and uh, as I was saying also the communal institutions greatly uh, you know um, pushed for this um, uh, Renaissance because they they required um, 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 uh, an increasingly and always more intense and diversified production of writings mm -hmm um that uh, in turn contributed um to to uh, to widen their own uses um within society and we can't say that all summed up these were generally new cultural models mm -hmm. so um and uh, you can see that at every level even uh, the 12th century can be seen approximately, but no, no, you can argue that um, as the moment in which there is the rise of of, um, of national monarchies, or at least um, a new form of, of of feudalism that was um, strengthening its um, you know uh, institutional mm, structure. Think about the the newborn kingdoms of England and of Sicily that were not surprisingly very very centralized compared to the rest of Europe and how that required bureaucracy uh, administration and people capable of writing and controlling and of accounting and, uh, and all this stuff so um, so you see that where um, there is this uh, process of political and territorial recomposition under certain political entities um, it was uh, um, unavoidably needed a relation of um, of uh, you know um, of of uh, of people who, who could make these um, bureaucratic and administrative structures functioning to keep those territories and 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 even new kinds of writings themselves like the, the literally and this is the field of paleography you know which kind of 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 writing was best suited for documents or for I don't know uh, theological writing and this is why all you find I don't know that uh, that uh, that a university book had a certain um, writing uh, a document uh, a diploma had a different writing the the merchant accounts have had a different writing and because they were all uh, conceived as instruments in order to to fit well into that form of um, you know of, of knowledge recording that was needed to make things work. So in throughout paleography, you can study also this how you know within uh, the form of a letter and of a writing, um, it's contained even um, a conception of the world. Think about the, the so-called Gothic writing. Um, 
um, it's narrow and thin and and tall and isn't it exactly like uh, the architecture of gothic cathedrals yes it is and it's not surprised there is also a lot of ideology within it and um, and these all uh, and all these processes came definitely from someone wha who was thinking about them actively consciously mm, and, and and willing to to translate those uh, uh, thoughts into r into practice and giving a new order to the world in a certain measure, um, and um, uh, and obviously um, think about the courts and uh, you know these um, the great demand for uh, for culture uh, from those uh, uh, functionaries that were. Um, busy within the management of the uh, government's apparatus. So um, you, s you can see that, uh, as I was saying before, also in the offices of the citizen um, uh, magistrates, uh, in artisan uh, shops, in tribunals, uh, law was also a very important um, channel through which uh, 12th century Renaissance passed, uh, but even in the city squares and in the uh, you know in the royal courts or uh, or other uh, ro um, courtly offices, etc. So I especially the writing. This is a moment in which the usage of writing increases uh, dramatically, and um, it wasn't just like a, uh, it was always less than a symbol in a certain sense, even if we are in a world that conceived um, the world itself like a symbol and therefore writing was conceived in part like that. But writing starts becoming also um, an instrument to ordinate and classificate information of economical and political nature that quite often were starting to um, assume um, a, a proper language on their own. So to create new spaces, new ideas, and if you see that in perspective in complicating, uh, if you want, or, or better making, no, telling the truth, they, they had to, to make it simple from their perspective, but what I, what I really meant, the proper term is to, to making the world growing complex because the world was already growing complex and all these new you know languages were needed to understand that world mm. um, and um, think for instance about the uh, juridical relation between uh, private people you know the need of um, you know the increasingly um, um, frequent uh, uh, you know the development, the development of tribunals. You know, um, great parts of Europe had been up to that point essentially based on, on oral traditions about even about law and justice, etc. Now, societies are more complex, and they need to 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 keep uh, note and memory of, of what happens and writing down and and having documentary proofs. Um, so it's the whole. Um, collective life that is subjected to to a new mm, regulation, um, and even obviously uh, think about the economical needs. You know, mm, the capitals started increasing terribly at this point. Merchants had huge profits as as uh, there had never been in the previous centuries, so they needed to be to 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 count, to use numbers, to to keep track of uh, traffics to to um, to look at profits and you couldn't do that without documents let me tell you um, coming coming a little bit back um, to the relation between the uh, ecclesiastical and lay culture um, if you let if you look at ecclesiastical culture this time you see that um, it was keeping to dominate the scene um, and it would it would have dominated the scene uh, for for a very long time, um, and um, uh, uh, but you see the um, the rise at this point of the communal and seigneurial institutions mm, that therefore generated our protagonists um, 
within um, the uh, documentary production. And this was very important because the church, um, uh, for instance, had always kept track of of, of anything during the, Middle the early Middle Ages. Um, it's not a surprise that during the early Middle Ages the, the majority of documents you can find are mostly ecclesiastical in origin. Now, certain, um, you know, communities that traditionally, uh, maybe some were completely new, like the communal one, that take the lords or even the peasants, usually had remained silent in great part during the previous centuries. Now they, al s they also start writing. You find that uh, um, scholarization, especially in certain parts of Southern Europe, starts to spread even within the peasantry. Um, you, you see that there are new communities that are more aware of their political power and they want to, you know, um, get that um, legitimated through, through documents, through uh, to something that wasn't just the word, but you know something that they could keep and show into uh, legal um, uh, uh, places to to, s to claim uh, their their rights, etc. Um, and, and do you understand how this really you know um, make the whole situation expanding and 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 uh, uh, in getting even always increasingly more complex um, and. Um and this meant that uh, there were notaries and counselors and new uh, economical actors that they start appearing uh, uh, as authors of sources next to the monks and the clergy, giving life to a new like culture. This is very important for history uh, because, uh, you know, uh, take the ecclesiastical chronicles that essentially dominate and still and ca keep dominating in Europe especially in certain, in certain regions. But take, for instance, the fact that for the first time, laymen start to write. Uh, for instance, the history of their own city or the history of a certain seigneurial family um, or about their own family, because this happens. And, and therefore, uh, when we look at chronicles, especially um, of those regions where you know, the delay starts to, to be more you know, more important, like Italy especially, but also other areas of, uh, especially where there is a uh, greater urbanization, uh, you can start um, even reading a different type of history. And what is amazing of this, and I find extremely important, is that you discover that, um, you know, part of that written culture uh, appears uh, already formed, meaning that uh, this is peculiar especially of Italy, and that's why I, I'm insisting so much on it, that, um, you know, you, you notice that uh, it's not a progressive um, uh, emergence of this form of writing that it starts from zero and arrives. It is, it's that from a certain point, laymen start writing, and start writing in vernacular, and start talking about very uh, rational things. They don't write because they want to appease that lord or, or make, you know, um, uh, um, a, a theological construction or or, uh, or making, you know, something that uh, is ideologically oriented. But they, they start writing because they, they feel the need to write, because they, they start thinking that someone could you know, be interested to read those, and maybe that that it was useful within the people, uh, within the communities they lived in, and they start noting even things that um, other authors, especially those monks and uh, that wrote these uh, universal chronicles, wouldn't wouldn't even think about, and they they give you details that are previously unknown about uh, about. Um, uh, about European history, and it's extremely fascinating to think about how, uh, in a certain sense, um, there there had always been that part hidden somewhere. But simply for the fact that they didn't write, we don't know anything, or at least we know very few about them. And that is said, there was a, a very uh, a greater, uh, you know, a much more dynamic world than we can e than we can expect. And it's through the sources that we know history. So um, 
think about how that influences even our perception of Europe. I mean, this idea, for instance, that it was a renaissance, the, the idea that it was a growth, a development, it is probably biased in part by the fact that um, we tend to uh, to conceive, you know, uh, this change only because there was a change, and we don't see that, you know, even before there were people who did certain things, and that we had we we can't keep track of because for that time they didn't write, and of course they didn't write because maybe they didn't have any means, and 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 that and because that um, change practically occurred, but. Um, you know, if I, if I look at the sources of uh, of the early medieval period, I have you know weird stories written by people who had a very um, you know scanty um, knowledge of society as a whole. Now you see that, and you understand, you can sense that 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 people start talking about their world, but especially they they start understanding it in, in much broader terms, and you understand that those broader terms were present even before in great part. And it's just the nature of sources that sometimes influences us in thinking that, you know, a period in history was so mm, because we read it through, you know, the 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 words of, of, of those specific sources. This is a great historical problem. And it's very fascinating to to read um, history through these problems because uh, it makes you understand how imperfect our historical knowledge is in spite of all our uh, uh, efforts. Um, and um, and um, and yes, yeah, so this is I, I don't want to repeat myself excessively. So this was practically wha <laughs> what I wanted to talk about. So I usually understand a great moment of transition. Um, and this wanted to be just an introduction. We can't obviously talk about. Uh, I, I will surely make you know uh, many other chapters about the 12th century uh, Renaissance. Think about university at like schools, uh, the tr translations from from Greek and from Arab, and all you know the the consequences of this. So be sure I will come back in the 12th century Renaissance. But there isn't just this in medieval history. So for now, I thank you very much for listening, and as always, I repeat you <laughs> always the same things. If you like the video, please share it, because re that's really the best thing you can do for me, if you like my content. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, subscribe to my channel to receive further content, or so leave a like, or, or a dislike, I don't know, I deserve also dislikes, surely. Um, uh, and if you have any question, which is what I, I mostly care about, please write uh, it in the comment or write him in an email. And I could even decide to make a video just for you to answer that question, so that can be useful, especially now that I don't have ma so many followers. So once again, I thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and uh, I wish you uh, a nice time, and see you next time. Bye!